Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. So on behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to welcome here uh, at the University of New South Wales for the 25th National Conference of the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society and the 12th International Conference in Southern Hemisphere Meteorology and Oceanography. So on behalf of HEMOS, we would like to acknowledge the biblical people that are the traditional custodian of this land. We would also like to pay our respect to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. So we will first start with a welcome to country, which will be given by Auntie Lola Callahan. Lola is an Aboriginal health worker for the Child and Family Health Center of Ch Sydney Children's Hospital. Please, Lola. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to be here. Well, I got lost on the way, but I got lost with a friend. So thanks for your help. Um, my name is Lola Callahan. I am from the La Perouse Aboriginal community of Botany Bay and belong to the Durable people. On behalf of the Bidjigal and Gadigal clans who traditionally occupied the Sydney coast, I welcome you all here today. My culture is based largely around respect for our land, our elders, past and present, and each other. In saying that, the welcome to country is our modern interpretation of seeking and receiving permission to walk upon other tribal lands, as Aboriginal Australia has many clans, tribes, and languages throughout and to reflect on a shared history and build a vision for a prosperous and reconciled future. The Kensington area of Sydney is significant to my Aboriginal community and my ancestors. Not far from here, during the construction of the new part of the hospital at Prince of Wales Sydney Children's, a traditional Aboriginal fireplace was uncovered. Using modern day technology, the fish oils that were present on the stones dated back to some 6,000 years. On behalf of the La Perouse Aboriginal Land Council, my ancestors, my elders, past and present, I welcome you all here today and I hope that you respect this land as my people have since the beginning of time. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much, Auntie Lola. Uh, my name's Alex Sengupta. I'm, I'm the other co-convener of the conference. Um, given it's Oscar, Oscar ceremony times, we thought we'd do a bit of a double bill. Um, we're gonna have um, Emma Johnson, Professor Emma Johnson, coming to the stage um, next to give a welcome to the University of New South Wales. Um, Emma is the head of the Applied Marine and Estuarine Ecology Lab at the University of New South Wales. And she was also the inaugural director of Sydney Harbour Research Program at the Sydney Institute of Marine Science. Emma's also become quite a celebrity star. Um, she's appearing on, in t on television quite often in uh, current affairs programs and science programs. And she's the host of the Coast Australia television series. Um, we're really pleased to have Emma today because she's been a real supporter and uh, vocal advocate for climate science in in Australia. So please welcome to the stage Emma Johnson. Thank you everybody, good morning and thank you to Lola Callahan representing her own people, Dawal people, but also speaking for the Bidjigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which this university is built and I'd like to recognise them, the elders past and present and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. So welcome to this really important conference. Welcome to UNSW Sydney. Uh, standing here with the honour of opening the proceedings, I'm humbled by the knowledge that you are all contributing to our collective future. And I note that the primary theme of the conference is translating your science into practical outcomes for the benefit of society. I'm also well aware, having worked alongside oceanographers and meteorologists for about 20 years now, 
that um, your discipline is challenging and exciting. It is now and it always has been. And it spans fundamental strategic and translational research. In the early 1900s, just as meteorologists were beginning to realise that fundamental physics and mathematical modelling would serve forecasting very well, the then prominent German physicist Friedrich Kohlrausch announced, no scientist with a regard for his reputation, his, will ever dare to forecast the weather. But demand was great, and um, we're not only asking you to use your fundamental insights and translational skills to accurately predict the weather over the short term, but to tell us how the climate is changing, and how and why this is affecting our weather, and how natural variability and climate change intersect to create weather extremes. Ultimately, what we're really asking you are two of the biggest questions of all. What does a planet's future hold and what am I going to wear tomorrow? And of course I jest a little but I do so to illustrate the breadth and the depth of the relevance of your research to so many, many people. Your data analysis models, formulae and forecasts are critical. Even more so because we have less data and fewer researchers focused on the southern hemisphere. Yet understanding southern ocean dynamics and the connection to atmosphere is critical to our understanding of global climate. I am a marine ecologist and I regularly wake in fright. For off the east coast of Australia, where I do much of my research, oceans are warming at two to three times faster than the global average, radically altering many different factors, including the composition of species off the coast of Tasmania, for example, and right here in Sydney Harbour. Marine ecologists around the globe and in Australia are asking questions that would have previously seemed inconceivable, including which reefs within our phenomenal natural wonder, the Great Barrier Reef, have refuge from the heat. We can't even consider this question or any of these questions without detailed understanding of the small and large scale oceanographic and meteorological processes across multiple time scales. But the relevance of my own research, um, the relevance of your work to my own research and how useful you can be to me is only part of why I'm such a big fan. More importantly, perhaps I am a global citizen living in a world facing significant change. And I don't need to tell you that the concentrations of greenhouse gases are rising relentless, relentlessly, but perhaps, and I understand we have got a few people, uh, international visitors, perhaps you might not realise that just recently at the Australian Open in Melbourne, our um, very famous tennis open, the uh, judges and experts and, and commentators were fretting over how heat was affecting our elite players. Now, when climate change begins to constrain sport, Australia listens. Um, so we're beginning to make inroads in understanding, but we still face considerable challenges communicating climate science, given the tone of much of today's public debate. Few of us here in Australia would have missed, for example, the most recent tirade aimed at one of our most esteemed colleagues, and in fact, your very own plenary speaker, Professor Terry Hughes. It was made by a Queensland tourism industry leader and this short-term thinker would prefer scientists to keep their findings on the Great Barrier Reef to themselves, presumably to prevent bad news scaring off international tourists and their dollars. Now, we don't need to waste a lot of time pulling this argument apart. Suffice to say, it wasn't particularly sophisticated and included a few rude words. But I'm sadly I'm still not surprised that climate science or the results thereof do meet with disbelief derision, distrust, and the shooting of the messenger. As scientists working to translate your understanding, your raison d'etre is to predict complex, dynamic future scenarios. And for decades, climate change scientists have been mainly telling people what they would prefer not to hear. To accept this information demands politicians industries, interest groups and ordinary people, many of whom are just used to doing things a certain way, make numerous changes, large and small. And 
Change is neither a linear nor a logical process all the time. We understand economic inertia and we are learning more about how people change. Our sociologists are finding increasingly evidence-based ways to change behaviour and assist understanding. And I think as a large group of researchers, you have a really, really strong connection with non-scientists. Most of us seem happy to trust in daily or weekly weather forecasts, packing our umbrella or our hat accordingly, and likewise, many industries plan even months in advance based on seasonal forecasts. This is an opportunity to connect climate science to a familiar setting and an existing knowledge base. What the public may not yet realise is that weather, seasonal and climate forecasting all rely on the laws of physics. This is a knowledge gap we may be able to address and there's an upward trajectory of understanding. We've come a late, long way, for example, from the 1900s when the fledgling Bureau of Meteorology was regarded as a backwater within the public service. In our sunburnt country, unpredictable weather was then something God or nature threw at us and we actually forged a cultural identity around our endurance in the face of droughts and flooding rains. Now, our farmers and our other industries routinely use seasonal forecasts of ENSO, for example, to inform their plans. Likewise, in 1938, when our meteorological services were judged to be not at present altogether sufficient to provide the necessary information required by pilots, as the aviation era unfolded, now we have a booming aviation industry with excellent safety records heavily reliant on excellent forecasts. So how can we ensure these considerable advances in understanding facilitated by theoretical and empirical advances and increasingly powerful supercomputers truly inform our future? This is where your conference main theme of translating science into practical outcomes comes in like climate services for decision makers, impact and risk assessment for weather extremes, improving urban environments and integrating renewables into our energy systems. As you play an active role beyond gener generating your new knowledge, which is critical, you will be seen as solution makers. As you partner with more people and organisations to address the what next, you will help provide an all important motivation for change. And this is also where your skills as communicators, how you tell your complex and dynamic stories clearly and succinctly can make a big difference. A key theme in the week's conference very usefully picks up connecting people personally to the science and explaining why it is robust, reliable and critical. The, un the community's widespread faith in weather and seasonal forecasting is a good entree point. But this does not mean you all have to become movie stars. Effective communication can take many forms. I'd like to highlight UNSW climate scientist Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick, for example. She runs a website called Scorcher, which explains heat waves. And that's something that's been very much on our mind in Sydney in recent weeks. But no matter how we communicate, this conference recognises the need to make more effort to connect beyond our disciplines and I applaud the public forum that will be held as part of this conference and all of the tweeting that I've seen going on from various uh, attendees and agencies. It really does help to reach out in this way. We know from experience that when only a few scientists stand up in the trenches, they are vulnerable to targeted and personal attacks. Not so if we are a chorus. So this week's conference is a chorus. It's one of the biggest and most important gatherings in Australia to date of meteorologists, oceanographers, and other climate scientists focusing on the Southern Hemisphere. And I believe you have almost 600 attendees. Personally, I am encouraged that momentum for change seems to be growing across many sectors. And I thank you for your past work, your future work in helping us understand oceanography and meteorology. At UNSW, we are particularly proud of our Southern Ocean scientists and our climate scientists, some of whom are both. We have backed them as a faculty of science and a university for many years, and we have seen them win due recognition of their work. We're proud of them all, and I'm pleased to see Professor Matt England will formally receive his Tinker Muse Prize at this assembly. 
In response to the great work that goes on at this university in these fields and the work that our scientists do to communicate their understanding, including Professor Matt England's leadership of the UNSW Global Challenge on Climate Change, we have a university executive that are more than acutely aware of the need for action. Our Vice-Chancellor this year announced we will be so becoming entirely solar powered within two years. This is particularly sensible as much of the photovoltaic technology used in today's solar farms was actually developed here on campus as well. And UNSW has held the solar cell efficiency record for 30 of the past 34 years. So it's one small step but it is a clear example of a meaningful response to research on the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions on our climate and oceans, and a positive note to end on. So I wish you an excellent meeting. I welcome you to UNSW Sydney. I do encourage you to take a dip in our rather warm patch of the Southern Ocean, which is a mere 20 minutes walk to your east. And I hope you find inspiration and strength in the sharing of your important fundamental, strategic and translational research in oceanography, meteorology and other climate sciences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma, for that wonderful introduction. Um, we're going to have a few words now from our two hosting organisations. So I'd like to start by welcoming, welcoming Mary Voice, who has been the president of the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society for the last two years, and it's almost coming to end, her, her leadership role. Uh, so please welcome Mary Voice. Thank you very much, Emma, for that lovely welcome. Um, we are very privileged today to be on the UNSW campus. It's really rather nice, except for the uh, works going on in the roads outside. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely, yeah. And I'll also say uh, thank you to Jim in advance, even though he hasn't spoken yet. <laughs> yeah. So, welcome, everybody. Welcome to this conference and to this campus. I have a question for you. Why are you here? Well, obviously most, many of us are here, all of us are here to learn more, uh, to learn about our sciences and so on. But I think there are many opportunities associated with a conference like this. Opportunities around our knowledge, our uh, continuing education, our professional development, uh, networking opportunities and collaboration opportunities. So clearly these conferences are important. In addition, however, does anybody know what these numbers are? The numbers around the continent relate to the capital cities and then there's another number over on the right hand side. Well, they are the number of air passenger movements at our airports around Australia in, in a year. And over on the right hand side, the number of cruise ships that go in and out of Sydney and the adjacent port of Newcastle. Uh, in, in a year, uh, recent data. They're quite phenomenal numbers if you look at them. And they tell us a story about our sciences, our sciences and services. And what about this number? Does anybody know what this number is? Two million, that's the number of estimated lives lost from tropical cyclones, hurricanes, etc in the last approximately 150 to 200 years on this planet. So those numbers represent just some of the people, your sciences and your services help to travel safely or hopefully to live safer in the future on our planet. 
and the tropical cyclone numbers obviously give us some indication of the potential for improved early warning systems, which have been a key feature of meteorological services in recent decades. So, your society, AMOS, and I'm sure the American Met Society as well, are very pleased and proud to bring this conference to you. So we ask you to please participate fully in all the activities of the conference and we want you to enjoy it. We would also, I would also like to suggest that there's been a large number of people who have worked extremely hard to put this conference together and that lovely acronym up there, well it's not up there at the moment, <laughs> um, oh, it's over the, over the side, ICHMO, I-C-S-H-M-O, ICHMO, what a lovely way to say an acronym, eh? So I would like to suggest to you that during the conference, when you see a conference organiser walking around the corridors, just go up to them and say, thanks, ICHMO. So... I'm sure later in the conference we'll have plenty of time to give formal thanks to all the people involved in organising this con conference. But as you go through your days, think of, think of the work that goes into organising it and make sure you uh, acknowledge it when you see people. Thank you very much, Alex. Next, I'd like to bring on stage uh, our represented, representative from the American Meteorological Society, um, Professor James Remwick. He's the chair of the AMS Scientific and Technological Activities Commission for Meteorology and Oceanography in the Southern Hemisphere. Thanks, James. Thanks very much, Alex. Yeah, what a mouthful. And as Mary was just saying, ICHMO has got to be one of the worst acronyms I've ever heard of. So I just like to talk about the Southern Hemisphere Conference. That's what it's been known as since, since it began. So, yeah, I'm here wearing my hat as the chair of that um, long-winded named uh, commission of the American Met Society. And I'm here, of course, just to welcome you all to the conference on behalf of the AMS, and even though I haven't asked for permission, um, I thought the, the new president of AMS, um, Jenny Evans, ex-Melbourne, would probably wish to uh, welcome you to the conference too, so uh, sort of a, a pseudo-welcome from Jenny and from the whole executive committee of, of AMS. I think um, this Southern Hemisphere conference series has been a really a great success. The, um, the Southern Hemisphere conference family is, is a really um, vibrant community, and I think this theme on Southern Hemisphere science is a great unifying theme. We get all sorts of um, presentations from all sorts of disciplines, but it's all about the Southern Hemisphere, and I find that really exciting. I'm a really enthusiastic supporter of the, the conference series. So it really is my pleasure to welcome you to this 12th ICHMO, plus, of course, the 25th annual conference of the Australian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society. So the, the ICHMO conference series has been going for um, 35 years now, since 1983 the first conference occurred. And um, it's been almost every three years, somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere since then. And in that time, I was thinking, there's been a huge growth and um, a huge increase in our understanding of all sorts of things to do with the Southern Hemisphere, um, meteorology, ocean, uh, oceans and climate. Um, for instance, the early 1980s really was the beginnings of the uh, proper use of satellite information for estimating the state of the atmosphere and the um, temperature of the sea surface and so on. And there's been huge increases in the use of satellite data in that last 35 years. 
and big, big increases in the quality and reliability of um, numerical weather prediction for the southern hemisphere, for instance. And at the same time, um, we've developed a much richer understanding of the oceans, uh, globally, of course, but especially in the southern hemisphere, again with um, surface satellite estimates of sea temperature and so on, um, but also, more recently, the Argo program that's given us uh, data on the oceans down to a couple of kilometres depth at least, plus a whole suite of research voyages around the hemisphere. So we've developed a much better ability to um, analyse the oceans, to model ocean variability and understand how the ocean interacts with the atmosphere and with um, the Antarctic um, ice shelves and so on. And of course in that last 35 years with better understanding of the oceans and better um, analysis of the atmosphere, the growth of uh, seasonal forecasting, and not just numerical weather prediction, but the first successful ENSO forecasts occurred during the 1980s, and that led to the whole growth of, of the seasonal prediction um, enterprise, which is really an integral part of meteorological services around the world these days. In that uh, period too, um, the key paper on the, uh, the discovery of the ozone hole occurred in the 1980s, so it's been the era of the ozone hole as well as uh, our increased understanding of the, the circulation. And I would say, you, you might say, um, sort of been the rise of the annular mode in the last couple of decades especially, that the variations in the westerlies over the southern oceans and our understanding of how ozone depletion and, um, of course, greenhouse gas increase affects the, the average circulation in the southern hemisphere has been a really exciting development uh, in the, the era of the southern hemisphere conferences. And of course greenhouse gases, it's, it's also been the era of much greater understanding, much greater public perception of climate change, uh, global warming. And I think for us um, here in Australia, New Zealand, the understanding of Antarctica has been a really integral and exciting part of that um, increase in knowledge in the last 30 odd years, both realising and understanding what the Antarctic can tell us about climate history from ice cores and so on, but also understanding about the, the sensitivity of the ice shelves and ice sheets and how the ice interacts with the ocean and the atmosphere and just how sensitive um, some of these apparently unchanging um, ice fields actually are. Not only, uh, I remember one of the Southern Hemisphere conferences in the late 1990s, someone gave a talk about um, tropical influences on Antarctica and, and one of the, the big names sitting in the front row at the end of that talk just said, oh, well, you know, that's all a load of rubbish. Antarctica's far too far away from the tropics to really ever feel its effects. I think it was later that year the first paper started coming out explaining how, in fact, Antarctica is affected by the tropics, so that's been another big area of interest um, over the last few decades. And just to wrap up, I think it's, it's wonderful to me to look at the program and see all of these strands represented in the presentations we're going to hear this week, plus a whole lot more that I haven't even touched on. So uh, I think it's n there's never been a better time to be a Southern Hemisphere researcher. So many new developments, so much more knowledge we have now than we did in 1983, and yet there's so much more to find out. So um, just fantastic time to be doing the sorts of work that we're doing. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the presentations this week, to hearing your stories, your reflections on, on the science, and on just what's going on south of the equator. So um, welcome again, and I just wish everybody a really wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, James Rimwick. Uh, I hope you all feel well and truly welcomed. Um, now the moment you've all been waiting for, the conference logistics. Um, we'll try and keep it brief. Um, just in case you've been disoriented by our uh, lovely public transport system that's in a bit of a shambles, uh, we're situated here, about seven kilometers south of the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Opera House and we're about a 20 minute walk in that direction to the beach. Um, for our American visitors 
We do have a McDonald's in easy walking distance or driving distance. Um, here's a map of the, the university. We're situated here in the Clancy Auditorium. So that way is facing towards the north. Um, we try to choose somewhere that's closest to Coogee Beach. So if you head in this direction, so if you head down in that direction, you'll hit the beach. Um, most of our activities are going to be situated in this region here. So just behind the Clancy Auditorium, we have the Matthews Buildings and the Matthews Pavilion. Um, in case of emergency, um, if you just head out of the doors and travel in that direction for about 30 metres, you'll hit the library lawn and that's our emergency meeting point. If you head out to the main road here and just turn left, you'll come to a bus stop here if you want to take a bus into Central. Um, the other option is to head in the opposite direction towards Coogee and if you walk for 10 minutes you'll come to a number of bus stops that can take you all, all around the, the city. Um, for any, anyone who's not familiar with our public transport system, you will need one of these things, an Opal card, to get on and off buses and trains and ferries. You have to tap on when you get on, tap off when you get off. Um, the closest place to buy one of these Opal cards is just behind the Matthews Pavilions in the post office. So here's a, um, a, a zoom in map of, of where we are. Here's the Clancy Auditorium. Um, we have left luggage, the registration desk, uh, the speaker's preparation room, which is just over there, um, all taking place in the Clancy, and all our plenaries will be taking place in here as well. If you go behind the Clancy Auditorium, we've got the Matthews um, Theatres and Matthews Pavilions. Um, that's where all our breakout sessions are going to occur. We have the Matthews Pavilion here, which is where the posters are going to be set up and where we have uh, morning tea and afternoon tea every day. Just behind here, we've also got a staircase going down here that drops down one level and that goes to the food courts. There's lots of um, food, food outlets there. There's also an ATM if you need to draw cash. Um, if you go down into the food court and head backwards, you'll enter an area that, where there's lots of tables and plugs and things if you want a quiet area to work or to have meetings. You're also welcome to go and use the library um, just situated in that direction. Um, and this afternoon or this evening we've got our icebreaker and that will be also uh, taking place behind the Clancy Auditorium in this area here. So just to um, mention a few of the events occurring, so this afternoon at afternoon tea we have um, a special celebration for the Scientific Committee of Antarctic Research. It's their birthday celebration, so please come and uh, grab a bit of cake. And then tonight we have the icebreaker starting as soon as sessions finish, and we also have uh, the early career researcher event starting at seven o'clock. Tomorrow, um, our big event is our public event. Um, some of our keynote speakers are gonna be presenting in here. Um, if you haven't registered, please uh, do so, um, just so that we've got numbers, we know who's coming, we've got public coming in from outside as well. Um, you don't have to write this down, if you go to the website, you'll find uh, a link to, to register your attendance. Most of these speakers and a couple of more will be giving keynote presentations during the week. Uh, I'll just note that today we've got Helen Clue coming up in a, a few moments, and then later on this afternoon, Matthew England from UNSW will be speaking. I think Laurie was going to come and take over now. Okay, so tomorrow, no, not tomorrow, sorry, Wednesday afternoon, we have the conference dinner, which will be a cruise on Sydney Harbour. So a great opportunity to see uh, the Sydney Bridge and the Opera. Uh, so the Wednesday afternoon is free, so you'll have to make your own way to the boat. There are two pickups, uh, one in Darling Harbour and one in Circular Quay. So we'll give you uh, more information about that on Wednesday morning. Uh, but please uh, don't miss the boat, which is the most important thing. Uh, you should all have uh, one of these tickets, oh, you can barely see it, with your registration. So again, don't lose this ticket, it is your uh, pass on the boat, 
But also, if you, for one reason or another, you don't want to come to the dinner, uh, you can leave your ticket at the registration desk and we will give that ticket to one of our volunteers. Um, just a bit of logistics on oral presentation. Uh, you can upload your talks uh, via a Dropbox link. Uh, that was sent to you by an email last week. But if you don't want to do that, you can also go to the green room, which is just right there, and upload your talk with an USB stick. We ask you to upload your talk about uh, four hours before. So if you are in a morning session, please upload your talk the day before. It's very important. The talk are 12 minutes long with three minutes, uh, with three minutes for questions. And um, we also have lightning lectures. So lightning lectures are three minutes and no question. It's a very tight schedule for those ones, so please respect it. For poster presentation, you may have noticed that we have two sessions. So the first session runs from Monday morning to Tuesday afternoon. So we ask you to take off your poster Tuesday at 5 p.m. And you have the opportunity to show your poster during those time here, so 3.45 to 4.45 on Monday and Tuesday. The second session runs from Wednesday morning to Thursday afternoon, so again, Wednesday about 8, 8 a.m. to Thursday, 5 p.m., you have to take it off. Uh, we also wanted to set up uh, a system here where eventually you can try to ask for a meeting with a poster presenter if you want to see them outside of this time. Uh, we have a series of workshops, so a few, two of them were held yesterday, they were very successful. We have eight more to go during the week. So if you have registered for one workshop but don't want to attend, please also notify us at the registration desk. And on the contrary, if you are interested in one of those workshops, you can find detail on our website. Uh, just go to the registration desk and see if you can uh, secure uh, one spot for those one. Uh, internet access, we have EduRoam, so most of you should be able to just get on with EduRoam, but if you can't access EduRoam, we also provided you with a Wi-Fi link, so you need to follow that link, put on the password, and note that it will take 24 hours to get active, so we apologize for this, but this is the way it works. We also set up an app, which has a f still a few glitches, so we apologize for that, but you should be able to download it. And it's going to be very useful for us to um, give out the student prizes. So we have one student prize for the best oral presentation and one student prize for the best poster. And the only way for you to vote is through the app. So you have to go to the polls and feedback and vote for your best poster. Those prizes will be given out on Friday during the conference wrap-up. Uh, finally, we would like to thank all our sponsors for their very generous support to make this uh, conference uh, possible. I think we're um, now done with uh, this uh, uh, welcome. We hope you have an excellent conference and you really enjoy your time in Sydney. We encourage you to go down to the beach. It's really great. The water is warm. Uh, but let's go with science. So we will have our first plenary speaker. And I will hand over to Mary, which will introduce Ellen. Hello again, everybody. It is my very great pleasure to introduce the RH Clark lecturer. Uh, our opening plenary session for this conference. Reg Clark was a meteorologist. He had a long, distinguished career in meteorology. He, was, he worked both in the Bureau of Meteorology, CSIRO, and at the University of Melbourne. He was deeply interested in several weather phenomena. Uh, he was Chairman of the Royal Met Society Australian branch from 1976 to 1980, and that was a predecessor to Amos. He was instrumental in two very significant field experiments in Australia, the Wangara and Kuran field experiments, gathering data regarding the boundary layer. This lecture recognises Reg's significant contributions in Australia. And so I have great pleasure in uh, telling you about our 
special lecturer this morning, Dr. Helen Clue. Helen is an atmospheric scientist with almost 30 years experience combining research discovery, delivery and leadership. She's worked in quantifying interactions between the land surface and the atmosphere and their effects on weather, climate and hydrology and also water use and carbon uptake. She's currently director of the CSIRO Climate Science Centre, which brings together the core of CSIRO's capability in modelling and observing the atmosphere, ocean, etc. The centre collaborates closely with national and international research partners to deliver knowledge and information products and service to a broad community of research and end users. So you can see how important that role is. She's had several um, uh, important roles in the past as well, uh, which you can read in Helen's biography. So it, as I said before, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Helen to the platform to deliver the R.H. Clark Lecture with her title, which is up there for all of you to see. Welcome, Helen. Good morning, everybody. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I want to especially thank Amos and Mary for that introduction and to Amos for this opportunity. Uh, it's wonderful, actually a little bit daunting, uh, to look out and see so many colleagues and so many experts in this field. As, my, as the introduction from Mary said, I came into this role as an atmospheric scientist, researching the interactions between the land and the atmosphere. And so to be presenting today the uh, R.G. Clark lecture is just such an honour because Reg Clark, as Mary has said, among his many accomplishments, was responsible for the famous, for a boundary layer meteorologist like me, the famous Wangara and Curran field experiments. And apologies for my New Zealand accent if I didn't quite get that right. Um, much of my career has been involved in doing field measurements to challenge our models and then to use those models to, the way I put it, better manage the land-air interface. And so I have such a strong affinity with Reg's work. And when I was an undergraduate and starting to get interested in this, I was in awe of those early field experiments, including their building of an instrument called the Evapotron and the Fluxotron. I was very interested in measuring evaporation and I was very interested in that. So that brings me to today's talk because my interest, perhaps like Reg's, I don't know, resulted from my early years growing up on the land. I'm a farmer's daughter. And that was where I became interested in the role of microclimates and how they affect agricultural productivity. That was why I got interested in measuring evaporative water demand. But most of all, I learned about the importance of managing climate risk. So today's talk really is about the role that our climate change research has in building preparedness and resilience to climate variability and change in the context of broader environmental change. This somewhat reflects the mission of the Climate Science Centre, but this is a national challenge. It's much bigger than the centre alone, and it requires a national response. A discussion about how climate change research can deliver national benefit through translation into practical outcomes is not only consistent with the theme of this conference, but I'd say it's been a constant theme throughout my career, including in my current role. Now Australia, as we've heard so eloquently from Emma, uh, has always had to manage the challenge of a highly variable climate with re weather related extremes that have affected our agriculture, our industries and our infrastructure, our economy and our communities. It's meant that Australian research has always played a role in helping Australians manage and adapt to the impacts of weather and climate, both the risks and the opportunities. But we have a change afoot, as you all know. Global climate change, driven by human emissions of radiatively active greenhouse gases, radiatively active gases, especially the greenhouse gases, of carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide, along with their synthetic counterparts, are disrupting the climate system. 
Through an enormous, almost unprecedented global research collaboration, steered by international programs such as the World Climate Research Program, and synthesized through our IPCC multi-year climate assessments, the evidence is clear that human greenhouse gas emissions are causing changes in the climate system that are unprecedented on millennial timescales. Australia's research has contributed significantly to the combination of observations, process studies and modelling that have enabled us to understand and attribute the role that human activities are having in these changes in the climate system including our observations of multi-decadal trends in ocean heat content and ocean warming, the record of near-surface air temperatures, observed changes in our cryosphere, including, importantly, the Antarctic and its interaction with the surrounding ocean, and the impact that all of that is having on sea levels. This high-quality research capability sorry, <laughs> has been a great strength in Australia, and it's provided us with an incredibly strong platform for informing national and global plans and policies for climate mitigation and adaptation. It's an important capability for our region as well, Southeast Asia, the Pacific, Indonesia. Australia's research capability will continue to be sought by our neighbours. Moreover, we have key parts of the climate system in our own backyard, as we've heard this morning from James, which is so important in the future trajectory of climate change, such as the way that the Southern Oceans sequester heat and carbon. This is all very important because Australia's already highly variable climate is changing as a result of global climate change with significant consequences for our climate sensitive ecosystems and our economy, as, as you heard from Emma. In particular, the changing nature of our weather extremes, whether it's heat waves in our cities or in our regions or in our marine environments, extreme fire weather, the frequency and severity of severe storms and heavy rainfall events and tropical cyclones, Storm surge and coastal inundation and combinations of all of these extreme events will all have significant impacts on our ecosystems and the services they provide. We're already seeing some of those impacts today. Um, you've all read about them, you all know them, you're living and breathing that. I don't need to go through the list. And we also know from our science that they will continue into the future. Our research and our observations show that old patterns are shifting. Records are being broken. Phenomena such as ENSO and the Indian Ocean Dipole, which affect Australia's year-to-year -year climate, are changing as a result of this disruption to the climate system. And you will hear so much more about this new research throughout this conference, especially as it relates to Australia and the Southern Hemisphere. This means that the past is no longer a reliable guide to the future. No longer can we just use statistical models that worked in the past and assume they're going to work in the future. As a nation with a strong history of adapting to a highly variable climate, we need to sustain and continue our research, our observations, our models, our process understanding to enable Australia to be prepared and resilient in the face of climate envi and environmental change. Now, you don't need me to tell you, talk about this for 45 minutes, you all know it. That introduction is really to set the context of what I want to talk about today, which can be captured in these three points. Firstly, if climate change research is to deliver national benefit to Australian society, then it needs to be relevant. I call this, and I'm quoting from someone else, I call this the useful and used challenge. The second point that I want to talk about is, well, what are some of the priority climate change research questions? In Australia, it might be understanding how this is going to affect our monsoons in the north, where there's plans for enhanced um, development, or it might be how is rainfall going to change in the Murray-Darling Basin, or how will the intensity and frequency of marine heat waves, which Emma spoke of before, that have had such impacts in recent years, change? So what climate change capability do we need to answer these critical questions? We're a small nation, really. We can't do everything. What do we do ourselves? What do we do through partnerships? And what do we let others and the rest of the uh, global science community do? What are some of the advances in technology that can help us? And what new partnerships do we need to build? I call this the climate science and capability challenge. And then the third thing is, well, what do we need to do differently? Now, I need to manage your expectations. I've only got 40 minutes, and I'll warn you, I do go right up to 40 minutes. I don't have time to cover all these questions today. Um, and it's incredibly important for me to say that it's not for me to provide all the answers. It's for you, as our research community and the users of this research, to be thinking about it. My point today is to provoke some discussion throughout this week. 
And this is an important time for this because it has been a tumultuous time uh, for the climate change research community, especially in recent years, with significant changes to our funding that has had consequences for our capability. But more broadly, globally, we've got the Paris Agreement, which has changed the perspective of our stakeholders as well. In short, the climate change research landscape is being disrupted as well as the climate system that we're studying. So it's a good time to take stock and think about our strategy for the coming decades. And in keeping with the theme of this conference, I think there's room for improvement and our commitment and ability to, to translate our research advances so that they are also delivering societal benefit and practical outcomes. Now, I'm not the only one to have been thinking about this. It's been a discussion through the strategy um, development within our centre. Uh, it's been a discussion around tea tables across Australia and indeed in some of our international programs, such as the World Climate Research Program. And much of what I'm talking about today comes from those conversations. So can I just now acknowledge all of those colleagues who have found some of their thoughts represented in the slides behind me. So let's start with the first question. What do our stakeholders need? In striking a global agreement to stabilise the Earth's climate to two degrees or less, the Paris Agreement, in my view, is one of the clearest demonstrations in my career of a policy or an agreement that is firmly rooted in science-based evidence. But more importantly than that, it's been a really significant market signal to the broader uh, stakeholder community, including the corporate sector, because of the transition risks and opportunities that are associated with the shift to a carbon constrained economy. Whether that's changes to technology like the rise of renewables or changes in the regulatory environment that are going to influence emissions from industries such as agriculture or other industries. We have transition risks that are important for the corporate Australia. This sit along beside the physical risks associated with the physical impacts of climate change that we're all very aware of. And over the last 12 months, we've seen much expert opinion acknowledging that boards and company directors may indeed be legally liable for failing to mitigate, adapt to, or disclose climate risks. In short, climate change isn't just an environmental problem, it's a financial risk for business, and it's also a potential legal risk. This means that businesses are seeking information about future climate to guide their decisions and risk assessments and for their stress testing. And it's not just the corporate sector. The sensitivity uh, to climate of many sectors is estimated to be worth order millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. The magnitude of that risk means there is a demand for our information about climate change, ranging from, at one end, is it real and do I need to think about it? through to wanting incredibly highly detailed future climate information at scales and for processes that our science can't yet deliver. This demand is happening in Australia and it's happening in our region. There have been several efforts to better understand what these needs are of our stakeholders. In a nutshell, if I could put it in a, in a sentence, it would be the sentence in that blue box. At the headline level, it's absolutely critical for the need um, given the reality of climate change and the need for effective and complementary adaptation and mitigation actions, we need robust science, objective analyses and credible information. That's what you do. That is what is needed. I want to make this important point about the complementarity of adaptation and mitigation. Our science needs to inform those weighing up of the costs and the benefits about managing climate risks and opportunities now and into the future. But coming into slightly more detail, what is it that our users need? Well, we need to understand that better. We need to reach out. If they're decision makers and managers, um, they need to know about trade-offs and the costs and benefits associated with different actions. If they're policy makers, they're going to be needing to think about what current actions mean for the future. Other users, and these can be other researchers. I'm thinking again of Emma's opening address where she talked about marine ecologists who need information to inform what's happening in their part of research. So it's other researchers as well. So they need information that can be integrated into their models and their tools. These are the things that we're hearing that stakeholders want. We're also hearing that our information needs to be discoverable and accessible. We know that users of our climate science get frustrated when they go and access data sets, but they find there's four or five of them and they all kind of look the same. What should they use? As research providers, we need to think more about coordination and consistency. 
And we also know from our um, uh, discussions that we've been having that uptake and adoption is much more effective. In fact, it's not going to happen if we don't support it with skillful knowledge brokering and communications. That's critically important, along with capacity building in our research community. So information that's needed for adaptation planning, therefore, needs to be credible, it needs to be consistent, and it needs to be relevant locally. Users want to know about how to work with uncertainty. They want information in a form that they can use in their own applications. And this demand for information that's relevant locally drives us to needing to think about how we provide high spatial resolution information across timescales that interact with other domains. This is a challenge for our science, but it's what our users say we need. But as I've said before, it's not just adaptation, it's the complementary mitigation that we need to do as well, because managing the long-term challenges of climate change is all around mitigation. So we need our science to um, inform um, the complementarity between mitigation and adaptation, identifying connections and trade-offs. Users of our research have told us over and over again that the credibility, legitimacy and salience of our science is paramount. This is a non-negotiable. It means that we must continue to deliver the highest quality peer-reviewed research, building on the best possible science. But it needs to be relevant and it needs to have an Australian focus. But climate change is a global phenomenon. Our climate here in Australia is affected by teleconnections and processes that extend far beyond our shores, as you all know. That means we must continue to be connected to the international research community through um, research programs and, importantly, through our global observation networks. Capability also means people. We need people with the right skills, um, scientific skills, leadership and, and experience. But it's not just physical climate skills. Increasingly, to deliver um, research that is relevant to user needs, we need to go beyond physical climate science. We need to build teams with skills that include biology, psychology, social science, economics, software engineering, etc. And of course, our science depends on observations and modelling and the infrastructure that goes with them. So speaking of capability, then, let's go to the second challenge. What are some of the research questions and capability that we need? And in framing this, I have actually used a couple of papers by colleagues who I'm sure in the audience, they'll recognise the, the thinking, um, John Church and Christian Jakob. I've kind of put them together into five key questions. So the first is, are we on track? This goes to continuing to take observations of the climate system to see how it's unfolding. Is it unfolding the way we thought it would, given our mitigation options, or do we need to do something differently? The second part of this is actually disentangling and attributing the role that human activities have um, in the context of considerable variability. This, what I call disentangling and attribution of human factors, is also really important both to understand how the climate system is evolving, but also in the way we communicate to the public and stakeholders and end users so that they understand that there is year-to-year -year variability and even multi-year variability superimposed on that long-term trend. That's an incredibly important challenge for our science. And the third element, which I think is also important, is developing meaningful indices that we can use for reporting on how we are progressing. So are we on track? That's the first societally relevant question. The second is all about tipping points in the climate system and the consequences of crossing thresholds and abrupt changes. We know that these have significant consequences for our ecosystems and the services that they provide. But it's not just our natural ecosystems. Obviously, they are critically important to our economy um, and to all sorts, of, um, all sorts of aspects of the quality of our life. But human systems are vulnerable too. Think of cities, um, especially cities that are on the coast or cities that are in, uh, with vulnerable communities. So these tipping points are important to identify for both our natural systems and our human systems. Identifying these tipping points into the future, near term and long term, requires a very sophisticated 
modelling capability, earth system modelling, that I'll talk about in a moment. And this goes to the, cha the mitigation challenge, because is our, are our mitigation um, policies going to be enough to avoid these tipping points or not? And what are the consequences? So the third big question, as has already been mentioned this morning, is this interaction between climate change, climate variability, and particularly weather extremes. How will the frequency and intensity of these weather extremes change in a changing climate? We, to do this, we need to really refine our climate models more, our climate and our earth system models, I should say. We have to pay deep attention to climate sensitivity. There was a study a few years ago that suggested that if we could reduce the uncertainty or the range in climate sensitivity or climate models, I think it was by half, that would be worth trillions of dollars in an economic sense. So it's a continuing science challenge. Not only is it about climate sensitivity, but it's about enhancing the resolution of our models, but increasing the resolution is just going to create more noise if we don't think about what are those key processes that are contributing to extreme events that need to be resolved in our modelling. And it's why the new centre of excellence that started in recent months into uh, climate extremes, based here, but in University of New South Wales, led out of UNSW, but incorporating five Australian universities is so important. The fourth is all around ensuring that we inform both in an identification and an evaluation sense appropriate adaptation pathways. As I've already said, identifying these pathways is all about knowing what the climate's going to be like in the future. Often for our stakeholders, they want that in the near term, in the coming uh, years to decades, and in the longer term. Again, this is a challenge for our science. The fifth question I've kept to a whole slide to itself, because this is incredibly important. As a colleague of mine likes to say, Dealing or solving or managing climate change is all about managing carbon. And this is one of the uh, legacies, of course, coming out of the Paris Agreement. We need to continue to track the carbon cycle, the emissions, the sources and sinks of carbon. This is a challenge. Um, the Global Carbon Project delivers the global carbon budget every year. That's going to continue to be important. But as we go forward, I think our science is going to be demanded to, to use atmospheric monitoring to uh, verify regional emissions. This is a challenge, it's hard, but I think we've got the technology now and the modelling skills to give that a go here in Australia. And I think we'll be starting to be asked about, can we use this to verify our nationally determined commitments? Our science also needs to continue to identify risks. You could argue this is a tipping point question. Risks to our land and ocean carbon sinks. What are the implications of uh, these risks for the future climate trajectory? And then we come to the really thorny one. We know that the Paris Agreement to stay below two degrees or less relied in the latter part of the century, and that's what the graphic there is talking about, on negative emission technologies in the latter part of this century. We don't know whether they're feasible, things such as bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. We know that people are beginning to start asking questions about geoengineering. Our science needs to be able to inform what the impacts are going to be if we go to geoengineering options. So these are some of the big questions that I think our science needs to be able to address. So of course, what is our science? Well, in my view, our response is earth system science. Earth system science means modelling of the climate and earth system, all of the interacting components, including not just the physical components and the biology, but humans as well, to enable us to provide future scenarios of likely climate trajectories, both globally, but importantly for Australia. What are some of the feedbacks and interactions? Because that's going to influence the tipping points ahead. It requires sustained observations across the domains, to keep tracking the climate system as it unfolds, as I've already mentioned, and to challenge and improve our models. If we're going to keep improving our models, we also need to continue our research into understanding the climate system, its drivers, and how they're changing, the feedbacks that I've already mentioned, and including human systems. This is what I mean by earth system and climate science. It includes the interplay between variability and change and weather extremes and the interplay between the carbon cycle and climate and what that means for stabilising the climate over the coming century. This needs to be supported by our uh, observations, our high performance computing and data infrastructure and our collaborations, I've said. But let me remind you about 
the importance of the relevance to what our stakeholders need. We're doing this science because it's about providing the climate change information that they need that's based on credible, legitimate, salient science with appropriate delivery infrastructure and knowledge brokering. So I'm going to focus just for a couple of slides on modelling for a moment. And first of all, I want to talk about this point, that our end users actually don't care too much about whether it's climate variability or whether it's climate change. They want to know about future climate. So our science is challenged to provide, or our models are challenged to provide seamless prediction across weather, seasonal, interannual, decadal, and multi-decadal timescales. We're not there yet, but it also needs to be locally relevant, which comes to the challenge of downscaling, which I'll come to in a minute, or regional information. But a really great climate model isn't enough to be societally relevant. We need an Earth system model, as I've said, because it's all about managing carbon in the Earth system, whether that's uh, into the oceans or into the land. We know that though the sequestration of carbon to land and oceans is providing a huge ecosystem service, but it becomes at a cost. Ocean acidification, perhaps competition for land that could be used for sequestering carbon or for growing food. These are the questions that our modelling needs to be able to inform. That means not just biophysical systems, but human systems. And ultimately, wouldn't it be good to be able to deliver environmental prediction, like air quality under a changing climate? But that requires a focus on regional scales. And a coarse global climate model is not going to do that for us. We need to go to regional modelling to provide the data and information that's needed for informing assessments and decision making. That's going to require a multi-model approach to characterise uncertainty and to assess the confidence in these um, climate projections and predictions. And increasingly, now and into the future, it's not just physical climate, temperature and humidity and so forth. It's going to be about water, about carbon, about chemistry, about the coasts and damage. And as I've said, we need to focus on delivery and engagement with that box down the bottom, which is all of our end users across all of those sectors. But let's also remember that some of those users, sometimes we call them next users, are researchers as well. So that's the modelling challenge for us. A part of this modelling challenge has been addressed, and again, you in the audience know this is better than I do, through the Global Coupled Model into Comparison Project, or CMIP which has played an incredibly important role in standardising the experiments and providing an infrastructure for delivery of model data across all of the model simulations that are done out of the modelling centres, bringing it together, um, conducting experiments that help answer some of the big questions that are there and informing um, the round of IPCC climate assessments. That's been an incredibly important global exercise. Um, the CMIP-6 that we're in at the moment, the, the cartoon or the diagram that's there explains the three driving questions about how the system's responding to forcing, what are the origins and consequences of um, model biases and how can we assess future climate change given internal variability, the challenges to predictability and uncertainties in scenarios. This is a global effort that's needed to bring all of the global climate model simulations together so that the data can be delivered back to those who want to use it, but also to advance our science. However, any of you that were at Amos in August would have heard the excellent presentation from Dave Carlson, the former direct, executive director of the WCRP, who was talking about the cost. As we strive for these ever complex models, and that's what that, character, that cartoon is showing, is the increased complexity over the last decades in our, in our Earth system and climate models, we have what I call the data deluge. This is a, a graph coming out of the Academy of Science Review. The yellow bars, this is from 2010, is the increase in data holdings from model data, and then the blue is satellite data, and there's a little thin green line there of in situ observations. Managing the CMIP machine, as I call it, and the deluge of data and the ever-increasing complexity of our models, which our stakeholders have said they want, is an ongoing challenge for us here in Australia and globally. I just want to mention a couple of other capabilities that we have in Australia till I go to the third and last part of my talk. We all know that access is Australia's weather, climate and earth system model. It's a national capability for both operations, whether it's in weather forecasts or, or climate predictions, and research. Now, I should say that access aspires to be a national model across all timescales, weather, seasonal climate, uh, long-term uh, climate change and an earth system model. That includes 
um, a commitment to participation in the global CMIP into comparisons because that provides benchmarking and it enables our Access Australian simulations to be taken up in global climate assessments. Access aspires to provide seamless prediction across all timescales and aspires to be a very um, high quality climate model as well as an earth system model. Doing this has required significant national collaboration over the last decade between the Bureau of Meteorology, CSIRO, Australia's universities, and globally, particularly with the UK Met Office. It's also required and will continue to require considerable investment to retain this as a national capability that performs competitively and well on the global stage. And this is important because this map, which I've borrowed from Andy Pittman, tells us of the modelling centres that are participating in the CMIP6 international um, model into comparisons. And you'll note there's only one in the Southern Hemisphere, and that's the access model simulation. I do know that New Zealand, South Africa, and I have heard that perhaps even um, Brazil are thinking of being involved in CMIP6, but I think it's fair to say that the only active model development is happening here in Australia. It's really important. The Southern Hemisphere does actually play a pretty important role in the global climate, and for us here in Australia, we need to have a model system that we know we're testing and making sure is representing Australia's climate. So access is a critical capability that we have. But a global climate model, as I hope you've got the message in the last few slides or so, is not enough to provide that regional climate information that our stakeholders need. But over the last few decades, we've built a really powerful capability there too, to deliver climate change projections for regional Australia. And the latest, the state of the art, if you like, in that capability was climate change in Australia, delivered in 2015, which encapsulates many of the things that our stakeholders have said that we need. It's nationally consistent. It uses the latest science. It provides application-ready data, a whole bunch of really cool tools that you need, and information for end users. And yet, we're being told it's still a bit complicated, and we don't really know how to use it, and we're not sure whether we should use that or something else. So there is more work to be done. In 2016, the Australian Academy of Science, led by Trevor McDougall, did an assessment, a stock take of our capability. So beyond our modelling, and I'm today not going to talk much about um, observational infrastructure, not that it's not important, it's very important, but I don't have time, but our capability is also about people. And that's what the Academy Review did. It was a very useful stock take of what's the number of climate scientists that we have? And that survey found we have around 420 FTE of scientists in Australia working on climate. They're spread across an array of institutions. If you can read that fuzz, slightly fuzzy diagram behind me, there's a, a many institutions, whether it's CSIRO, um, the Australian Antarctic Division, Bureau of Meteorology, the universities, um, Geosciences Australia, and so on. They come together in a range of funded collaborative programs, the Antarctic CRC, the Earth System and Climate Change Hub, the um, ARC funded Centres of Excellence in Climate and the Access Project that I've talked about. And as I've uh, hinted at, we need to be supported by our research infrastructure. Access requires sophisticated high performance computing and high performance data infrastructure. That includes data curation, discovery, availability, and analytics and software engineering. So that's a very quick snapshot of what we've got in Australia. So you could argue that we actually are doing okay. We have an experienced and internationally recognised uh, workforce, highly collaborative, uh, delivering and demonstrably high quality research, meeting that credibility and legitimacy factor. We have much but not all of the critical research infrastructure to support our research. We are very well served by two at the moment, but one going forward, university-led centres of centre of excellence uh, focusing on climate system science. That's providing the underpinning science and the training of the next generation of researchers. And we have research agencies such as CSIRO and the Bureau, who are continuing to sustain our observations and our model development, delivering um, both applied and operational products. So, what needs to change? Well, arguably, many in the audience are probably thinking, but the Academy said we didn't have enough. And this is where I want to go to now. If I think back to the starting slides about what our stakeholders need and what I've read about what our stakeholders need and what I've talked to them about, 
then it's encapsulated by this slide. And starting from the, your, that one there, I can never do left and right, over there. Um, better engagement across all sectors. A step change in the delivery of our climate change products that target users' needs that can be integrated into other impact and risk assessment frameworks with fit-for-purpose data management and delivery systems alongside knowledge brokering and capacity building in the end-user community. Mechanisms that encourage and enable national coordination across research providers. Clear research priorities um, for those research needs that are necessary for Australia and our region, but are also internationally connected so that we can sustain our climate change research capability so that it is the right size the right shape and the right direction in terms of our skills, our infrastructure and our collaboration. That's what we need. And I've just added a couple of things underneath. It is about meeting Australians' needs, but it's in a global context. I saw an ad once for a set of glasses that I thought described this rather well, eyeglasses that is. Uh, global vision, local insight. I think that says what I'm saying, means what I'm saying. Aligned to the planning and the research uh, infrastructure investment cycle. Um, with a long-term horizon. That's what's needed. And here is the conundrum then. Because if we want to do all the things that I've said we need to do, continue doing research into these tricky problems, continue building our research infrastructure and building multidisciplinary and multi-institutional teams while sustaining our observations and developing our models and delivering a step change in our engagement and, and delivery, that all comes with resources and yet we're at a time when traditional investment in this, uh, in our resources for infrastructure and capability seems to be declining. My view, and this is the last sort of part of my talk that I want to leave with you, and it's perhaps slightly heretic, it'll provoke discussion I'm sure, is that part of the solution lies in framing the problem slightly differently. And it comes back to one of the boxes that I had on that earlier slide, which said a step change in climate change research and services. Well, what do we mean by climate services? We're going to talk at this conference about climate services. Many agencies have thought about what do we mean by climate services. I like the WMO framing, which is what's up there behind me, because it actually captures the whole. It's not just about meeting end user needs and engaging with end users, but it's also reinvesting in the underpinning um, infrastructure and modelling and science that we need to do. I like that holistic framing for climate services. So in the Climate Science Centre, we've been thinking a bit about this and in conversations with other people. And the cartoon that I'm putting up here, it is just a cartoon, it's just a conceptual model to try and say, well, what would a climate change research and services model look like for Australia? I've chosen to go away from climate services because it risks infusing with what our national weather agencies do. So I'm going to call it Climate Change Science and Solutions, hence the title of my talk. And as I emphasise, this is just a cartoon, and it's all about, well, if we want to provide information to inform adaptation and risk management, the, the blue box along that end, well, these are all the parts that we need, and I've already talked about all of those elements. Our climate modelling, not just one climate model, not just one Earth system model, but we're going to need regional models as well. We're investing in decadal capability, which I'll come to in a moment. When that matures, that can be part of that stable of climate models that we use. We need to continue to engage internationally through CMIP. We need to draw on our underpinning infrastructure. We know how to deliver that into projections, and we know how to deliver that into products and services. I've spent some time talking about that. But if we're to deliver and some of these key tricky questions around extremes, around uh, climate change across domains, say at the coast, combining both terrestrial processes and ocean processes, then we're going to continue to need the underpinning climate system research that's in the grey box at the top. So we need to bring that in and take it along that, what I call the knowledge value chain, to deliver to that ultimate goal around information to inform adaptation and risk management. But we're not going to achieve that last blue box alone. We have to build effective partnerships. I've just listed three there, that or four. That is by no means all. It could be with other parts of CSIRO, um, with government agencies, with the private sector, with other um, members of the corporate sector and globally. And here's the important part of this conceptual model. There has to be the feedback loop back into the underpinning science because it's by engaging with our end users and users of our research that we'll know how to shape and prioritise our research needs and 
and this simple model, I'm hoping that maybe that brings some investment as well. We have most of the parts to do this in Australia, but at the moment we don't have a national strategy to affect the coordination. We don't have the mechanisms to build the effective partnerships to enable the delivery. And we have to do better about explicitly considering end user needs, as I've already said. In my view, a climate change science and solutions conceptual model, a bit like this, could be, with much more thought, much more discussion, a way to think about how we grow the revenue to sustain and grow our capability that we need. That's that cycle. And it also is the way to connect end user needs back to the research that is needed. And so to just close with some comments on the way forward, there's a few other things that have happened. Yes, we've been through a tumultuous time in the climate change science community over the last few years, but there's some really, been some really important positive things happening too, and I'm just going to finish with a few of them. The first is that in 2015, but it really kicked in in a big way in 2016 and 17, was the Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub, funded by the National Environmental Science Program. As I said, began in earnest in 2017. This is the first time that the five universities in Australia with their strength in climate system science have come together with CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology into a funded consortium of research providers with a clear and explicit focus on meeting end user needs, or, and, and that includes stakeholder engagement and delivering tangible outcomes. In my view, the hub is a perfect opportunity to catalyse some of this national conversation and coordination that I've said that we need. But beyond the hub, we also have, thanks to the ARC investment in our Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes, the opportunity to be training new researchers to invest in some of that underpinning blue sky research that we need, that can be done in collaboration with the CSIRO and the Bureau. And the last thing that we have, and if you'll bear with me for just another three or four minutes, the last thing we have is the Climate Science Centre. Now, I wanted this opportunity, why wouldn't I, to talk a little bit about the centre, but I didn't want to put it first. <laughs> I wanted to tell you my story first. But I did want to finish to just say that CSIRO has made a decadal commitment to climate change science in Australia through the Climate Science Centre. Formally established in 2016, I came into the role just on a year ago. And um, the capability that's in the centre um, is really, you could encapsulate it as our, our physical climate capability, observations through modelling, through simulations. We're spread across three sites in Australia, a very small team in Canberra, uh, our colleagues in Melbourne at the Aspendale Laboratory and our marine laboratories in Hobart. We have around 127 staff as of today, so we're growing. We've got some new investment, which I'll talk about in a moment. And we're very focused on delivering national benefit through our excellent science, collaboration and partnerships. And that phrase kind of captures the mission of the centre and I guess it echoes everything that I've been saying in this talk. And thinking about how we might do that, we've articulated four strategic goals, which I'm just going to go through extremely quickly. The first is all about delivering value from our climate change science. We want to be recognised as a trusted advisor, that's our credibility, our legitimacy, through delivering national benefit and value through our credible science. I'm not going to go through the shopping list there of some of the work that we do, I've already talked about some of it, so I'll keep moving. But this is one of our strategic goals. But we can't do it alone. We're committed to collaboration and being a collaboration hub to strengthen the capacity that we have but also to ensure that we're delivering effectively. We need to partner with others to deliver integrated solutions, and that's through our strategic collaborations, both across CSIRO, and I have to say, that's still a work in progress, with our traditional research and operational partners, which arguably is probably going a bit better than some of our within CSIRO collaborations sometimes, such as the Bureau of Meteorology, uh, the UK Met Office, and our universities, particularly through the Centre of Excellence. But we've got new partnerships too. Last year we launched the Centre for Southern Hemisphere Oceans Research, which is a collaboration between CSIRO, UNSW and UTAS with the Queen, uh, Qindao National Marine Laboratory. And Seashore sits within CSIRO Climate Science Centre and there's a whole session dedicated to Seashore at this conference. So go and learn more about Seashore there. 
but we're a climate change group, so global outlook is critical. So we need to continue to engage with global science to advance our knowledge, of course, and to shape our research, but also to attract investment back here. So we're focusing on Australia and our region. We're focusing actually because of some opportunities and internationally trialling how some of these climate change services might be delivered. And of course, we need to continue to be engaged in our global observing and modelling programs. And this is the last one from the Climate Science Centre. We wouldn't be a science centre if we weren't investing in, investing in some new science. CSIRO has made a decadal commitment to building a decadal climate forecasting capability, the decadal forecasting project. This is a grand challenge. You all know that in the audience, but you know that it has a significant impact because it bridges that gap between seasonal climate predictions and climate projections. So again, there's a session on how we're going with our decadal forecasting project, and I encourage you to, to go and hear more there. So just to finish then, I, it's sort of like a call to arms, really. I think we have an opportunity now, because of some of the things that are in place, to galvanise a national case and a national effort. Building on the past, building on the amazing uh, legacy and, and continuing excellence we have in our climate change science and the institutional strengths that we have to realise the potential of our climate change research, but we need to ensure, to realise that potential, that that science is useful and used. If we can demonstrate that value to all sectors of the Australian economy and our stakeholders, then I believe that we will be able to grow the resources that we need to sustain this critically important capability. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank you very much, Helen. Don't go away. <laughs> Um, yesterday there was a weather presenters session uh, yesterday afternoon and one of the weather presenters, TV weather presenters, was quite loudly saying that there were not enough climate people in the Bureau of Meteorology because he could never get his information quickly enough to put on television in a, in a timely manner. So I think that is another example of the requirement for end user needs that, that Helen um, so clearly articulated today. So we are still highly needed, we just have to work out how, as Helen said, to, to deliver those end, end user requirements effectively. I think I can just fit in one very quick question if there is one, and it'll probably have to come from close by to the front because I'm not sure we've got... Um, microphone set up to take a question. Is there a very quick question anywhere? Perhaps we all need time to think. <laughs> but uh, I, oh, okay, just there. Okay, that, that's um, a, a, a very good research question. Have we got a, to a, a session on that at all? Can you tell us if we've got a session on that? We got one later? Okay, so I'd invite Helen to make a very quick comment. Yeah. I'll just make a quick comment. You're absolutely right. Um, it's the interplay between increasing greenhouse gases and aerosols that are important. As I said at my opening, uh, I couldn't possibly be comprehensive. I would have been here another half hour. Um, so aerosol research is important. Um, I, I think there's a session on it where you'll learn more about it. Our access model capability, we aspire to be a model that includes uh, chemistry and ideally uh, aerosol interactions as well, but I'll be absolutely honest, we've lost some key capability in that space. So it goes back to my point about coming up with a strategy so that we're recognising the value of this capability to drive an investment model that enables us to, to grow some of that important skill set that arguably we have lost over the last five to ten years. So I, I would invite you all to thank Helen for a very, very comprehensive overview and 
a challenge for us all to think about during the next few days. So thank you, Helen. Thanks very much.